Hello everyone, welcome to this next lecture on the era of Romanesque art and architecture and this focuses on specifically art and architecture from France and from other parts of Europe. So in terms of our timeline we have sort of skipped the medieval age, the early medieval age from the year about 500 to the millennium, the first millennium. Capturing the aspirations of a new age, Romanesque art and architecture started a revolution in building architectural decoration and visual storytelling. Starting in the latter part of the 10th century through the 12th century, Europe experienced relative political stability, economic growth, and more prosperity during this time, and coupled with the increasing number of monastic centers as well as the rise of universities, a new environment for art and architecture that was not commissioned solely by emperors and nobles was born. With the use of rounded arches, massive walls, piers, and barrel and rib vaults, the Romanesque period saw a revival of large-scale architecture that was almost fortress-like in appearance in addition to a new interest in expressive human forms. With the Roman church as the main patron, Romanesque metalwork, stonework and illuminated manuscripts spread across Europe from the Mediterranean to Scandinavia, creating an international style that was adapted to regional needs and influences. Romanesque art and architecture innovatively combined classical influences seen in the Roman ruins scattered throughout the European countryside and in Byzantine illuminated manuscripts and mosaics with the decorative and more abstract styles of earlier northern tribes to create the foundation of Western Christian architecture for centuries to come. While an immediate precursor to the Gothic style, the Romanesque would see revivals in the 17th and 19th centuries as architects came to appreciate the clarity and formidable nature of the Romanesque facade when applied across a range of buildings, from department stores to university buildings. The many Viking invasions of Europe and the British Isles marked the era before the Romanesque period. In 790, Viking raids began on the monasteries on the coast. In 845, they led to the sack of Paris and in 860, the sack of Constantinople. For the next 200 years, the Vikings raided and sometimes conquered surrounding areas. With the conversion of the Vikings to Christianity, the era ended around 1066 when the Normans, themselves descended from the Vikings, conquered England. Stone crosses and portable artifacts such as metalwork and elaborate gospel manuscripts dominated the period. Masterpieces like the British Book of Durrow and the Irish Book of Kells created by monks included extensive illustrations of biblical passages, portraits of saints and elaborately decorative carpet pages that preceded the beginning of each gospel. Insular art 
influenced both Romanesque manuscript illumination and the richly colored interiors and architectural decorative elements of Romanesque churches. Charlemagne became Holy Roman Emperor in 800 AD, effectively consolidating his rule of Europe. He strove to position his kingdom as a revival of the now Christian Roman Empire. Charlemagne was an active patron of the arts and launched a building campaign to emulate the artistic grandeur of Rome. Drawing from the Latin version of his name, Carolus, the era is known as the Carolinian Renaissance. As art historian John Contrani wrote, his reign saw the construction of 27 new cathedrals, 417 monasteries and 100 royal residences. While Carolingian architecture drew on earlier Roman and Byzantine styles, it also transformed church facades that would have consequential effects throughout the Middle Ages. Emphasizing the western entrance to the basilica, the west work was a monumental addition to the church, with two towers and multiple stories that served as a royal chapel and viewing room for the emperor when he visited. Carolinian murals and illuminated manuscripts continued to look to earlier Roman models and depicted the human figure more realistically than the earlier Hiberno-Saxon illuminators. This early naturalism had a lasting influence on Romanesque and Gothic art. During the early 900s, concern began to grow about the economic and political control that nobles and the emperor exercised over monasteries. Nobles rose taxes and they appointed relatives as abbots. Cluny Abbey sought monastic reform. He focused on peace, work, prayer, study, and the autonomy of religious communities. In 910, William of Aquitaine sponsored his hunting lodge to become an abbey. He stipulated the independence of the abbey from all secular and local authority, including his own. As a result, the abbey was answerable only to the authority of the Pope and quickly became the leader of the Benedictine order, establishing dozens of monasteries throughout France. So Cluny I was small and barn-like. Cluny II was erected around the year 955. It was based on the old basilica model. It employed round arches and barrel vaults and used small upper level windows for illumination. Designed with a cruciform plan, the church emphasized the west facade with two towers, a larger crossing tower, a narthex, a choir between the altar and the nave of the church and chapels at the east end. All of these elements became characteristic of Romanesque architecture. Pliny III was completed in 1130. The church became the largest in Europe, rivaling St. Peter's in Rome and a model for similarly ambitious projects. Started by Lombard Comacine Guild or stonemasons, the style was distinctive for its solid stone construction, elaborate arching that advanced Roman models, bands of blind arches or arches that had no openings, and vertical strips for exterior decorative effects. Particularly dominant in, in Catalonia, some of the best surviving examples are found in the Val de Bois. During the Romanesque era, 
No longer under constant threat from Viking raids, monastic centers, which had provided cultural continuity and spiritual consolation through desperate times, became political, economic, religious, and artistic powerhouses that played a role in unifying Europe and in creating relative stability. Monastic centers that housed religious relics became stops on pilgrimage routes that extended for hundreds of miles throughout Europe to the very edge of Spain at Santiago de Compostela. Christians revered San Santiago de Compostela as the burial site of St. James, a disciple of Christ who brought Christianity to Spain and thus deeply symbolic to Catholic Europe. This slide is an illustration of what the pilgrim looked like, the clothes that they wore during their pilgrimage, and also along the various churches along the route, and showing the interior of the final destiny of one of these Romanesque cathedrals. The faithful believed that by venerating relics or remains of saints, in pilgrim churches they could obtain saintly intercession on their behalf for the forgiveness of their sins. Fierce competition existed for valuable relics. Some monks even stole relics from other monasteries or churches. Important monasteries were included on the pilgrim's route. It also meant a growing of economies and the growth of towns. The Crusades were a series of religious wars between Christians and Muslims, started primarily to secure control of holy sites considered sacred by both groups. In all, eight major crusade expeditions occurred between 1096 and 1291. The crusades differed from other religious conflicts in that they were considered a penance by the participants that brought forgiveness for confessed sin. The Church of Sainte Foy was built around 1050 to 1130. This pilgrimage church, the center of a thriving monastery, exemplifies the Romanesque style. Two symmetrical towers frame the west facade, their stone walls supported by protruding piers that heighten the vertical effect. A rounded arch with a triangular tablature frames the portal, where a large tympanum of the Last Judgment of Christ is placed, thus greeting the pilgrim with an admonition and a warning. The grandeur of the portal is heightened by the two round blind arches on either side and by the upper level arch with its oculus above two windows. Here you can see depicted the blessed in paradise with the hand of God above, beckoning Saint Foy, the last judgment tamponum in the Church of Saint Foy, France. This is a detail of hell. The use of large scale stone sculptures in churches are one of the Romanesque period's defining features. The facade conveys a feeling of strength and solidity. 
its power heightened by the simplicity of decorative elements. It should be noted that this apparent simplicity is the consequence of time, as originally the tympanum scene was richly painted and would have created a vivid effect, drawing the eye toward the entrance. The interior of the church was similarly painted. The capitals of the interior columns carved with various biblical symbols and scenes from saint Foy's life, creating both an otherworldly effect and fulfilling a didactic purpose. saint Foy, or Saint Faith, was a girl from Aquitaine who was martyred around 287 to 303. The church held a gold and jeweled reliquary containing her remains. The monks from the abbey stole the reliquary from a nearby abbey to ensure their church's place on the pilgrimage route. Over time, other relics were added, including the arm of St. George the Dragon Slayer and a gold A believed to have been created for Charlemagne. The construction of the church was undertaken around 1050 to accommodate the crowds drawn by reports of various miracles. The church was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1998 for its importance on the pilgrim route and also as a noted example of early Romanesque architecture. It is an important stop en route to Santiago de Compostela. It is a pilgrimage church type. The exterior is still intact. The two towers on the western façade were never completed. Its a crossing tower was later built during the Gothic era. This image clearly depicts the later addition of the tower during the Gothic era. On the left, you can see the tympanum with a Mijeville entrance, and on the right is a close-up of some of the stone relief sculptures. The revival of stone sculpture is a hallmark of the Romanesque era. Abundant remains of ancient statues throughout Rome's northern promises allowed for large-scale sculptures to be created, and it also spoke of the period's prosperity. It also reflects the changing role of the church from small monastic communities to larger buildings meant for the lay public. Stone sculpture was a way to impress and educate the illiterate public. Larger scale carved biblical figures were rare before the millennium. Sculptures around the door was not so much on the door itself. The symbolism of the door was Christ is the door to salvation. Parts of the church door was regularly decorated, including the tympanum, the voisseaux, which form the archivolts, the lintel, the tomo, and the jams. Named for the River Meuse Valley in Belgium, where the style was centered around the town of Liege and the Benedictine Monastery at Stavelot. 
The style became famous for its lavish and highly accomplished metalwork, employing gold and enameling in both the cloison technique, where metal is used to create raised partitions on the surface that are then filled with colored inlays, and the champlève technique, where depressions are created in the surface and then filled. Noted metal workers were Godefroy de Clare, Nicolas of Verdun, and Hugo of Oignies. The Stavelot Triptych is a medieval reliquary and portable altar in gold and enamel intended to protect, honor, and display pieces of the true cross. It was created by Mohsen artists. Mohsen signifies the valley of the Meuse River. It was created around the year 1156 at Stavelot Abbey in present-day Belgium. The work is a masterpiece of Romanesque goldsmith work. The fresco of Christ Pontocrater is attributed to the artist, the master of Taul, and it was created around the year 1123. This vivid fresco shows Christ the Pantucrator, or ruler of the universe, framed by a mandola, or body halo, bordered in red, gold, and blue. He sits on a throne. He faces the view viewer full on with an intense gaze while holding a book that reads in Latin, I am the light of the world, as his uplifted right hand makes the traditional symbol of blessing and teaching. Alpha and Omega symbols float above his shoulders while two angels flank him their long curved forms echoing the lines of the mandola and drawing the focus to his haloed head. The greatest scale of his figure, reflecting a Byzantine influence, is meant to emphasize his importance. The four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, are depicted in a band of circles at his feet and turn to face him, gesturing. The work's innovative sense of composition, with its curving bands of blue, gold, and carmine, emphasized the semicircular apse and focused on Christ in the center. The use of varying shades of blue to depict him, along with highlights of white and carmine dots, create a sense of movement as if he were emerging toward the faithful. Below him, a number of other sacred figures are partially visible, including the Virgin Mary left off-center as she holds a chalice containing Christ's blood, a pioneering representation of the Holy Grail and indication of the cult of Mary that was developing at the time. Originally, the fresco covered the apse of the church of Saint Clement de Taul in Val de Bois in Catalonia. Consecrated in 1123, the basilica, with three naves and a Byzantine influenced seven story bell tower, was known for its exceptional interior murals, all considered to be the work of the master of Taul, about whom little else is known. Over time, Many of the murals were damaged, but those remaining, including this one, were transferred to canvas for exhibition at the National Art Museum of Catalonia. The Bury Bible is one of the great examples of Romanesque illuminated manuscripts. It was created around the year 1135, and the artist Master Hugo is attributed as the creator of most of the illustrations of the Bible. 
This page from an illuminated manuscript, the Buri Bible, shows two scenes in which Moses, depicted with a halo, explains the law to the Israelites. In the upper scenes, Moses explains the Ten Commandments as he lifts his hand in a gesture of teaching and blessing toward the small group seated on the ground and listening attentively. In the bottom scene, Moses tells them which animals are clean to eat and which are not. Doves are the symbol of peace obtained from following God's law, and they are depicted in the top right of that panel. We also see the technique of the damp fold being used. Overall, the work has a calm but vital stylistic flow derived from the curving lines and the blue, red, green and gold palette that is echoed in the patterned borders. Master Hugo pioneered this style, which came to be called damp fold, as clothing was painted as if damp to create both a sense of movement and a more realistic human form. Master Hugo was the first named artist in England, and he worked at Bury St. Edmund's Abbey, where he made this Bible for the Abbey around 1135. The Bible contains various paintings on full and half pages and decorative initials, which as art historian Thomas Arnold wrote, have led to a general acknowledgement of Master Hugo as the gifted innovator of the main line of English Romanesque art. He is also credited with making the bronze doors of the Abbey Church's western facade and two carved crucifixes, including the famous cloister's cross. The Bayou Tapestry is an embroidered cloth nearly 70 meters long and 50 centimeters tall, which depicts the events leading up to the Norman conquest of England concerning William, Duke of Normandy, and Harold, Earl of Wessex, later King of England and culminating in the Battle of Hastings. It is thought to date to the 11th century, within a few years after the battle. It tells the story from the point of view of the conquering Normans, but is now agreed to have been made in England. The cloth consists of some 70 scenes, many with Latin titulae embroidered on linen with coloured woolen yarns. It is likely that it was commissioned by Bishop Odu, William's half-brother and made in England, not Bayou, in the 1070s. In 1729, the hanging was rediscovered by scholars at a time when it was being displayed annually in Bayou Cathedral. The tapestry is now exhibited at the Musée de la Tapisserie de Bayou in Bayou, Normandy, France. The designs of the Bayou tapestry are embroidered rather than woven, so that it is not technically a tapestry. It can be seen as a rare example of secular Romanesque art. Tapestries adorned both churches and wealthy houses in medieval Western Europe, though it is exceptionally large. Thank you for joining me. See you in the next class.